Welcome back. This is World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. The 24th St. Petersburg International Economic Forum takes place in early June this year. It is under the theme, Together Again, Economy of New Reality. The forum, according to the organizer, is hosting guests from 130 countries and 1,200 companies. But what is even more important is what does this forum mean for post-pandemic recovery of the Russian economy and that of the world? We're also witnessing in the global economy, despite the magnitude of last year's downturn, which experts estimate to have been the biggest one since World War II, one can safely say that the world economy is getting back to normal. How might this platform aid international cooperation like that taking place between China and Russia? For answers, I talk to our panelists. We are joined from St. Petersburg, Jim Rogers, world-renowned investor, chairman of the Rogers Holding. Good to see you, Jim. In Shanghai, Dr. Zhao Long, professor of the Center for Russian and Central Asian Studies from Shanghai Institute of International Studies. Good to see you. Last but not least in Beijing, Xu Sitao, Chief Economist from Deloitte China. Good to see you, Sitao. Let me start by asking uh, you, Jim, the recovery of the economy, whether it's going to be real recovery or overheated, or it is going to be a joint recovery, or just a few economies. That's the key question there. Uh, Mr. Rogers, your take briefly. Well, it's a real recovery right now because there's been so much money printed and so much money borrowed and spent. So yes, you put trillions of dollars into the world economy and things are getting better. The question is, how long will it last? I would suspect it'll last at least several more weeks, maybe even months. But I doubt if it's going to last a couple of years because things are getting very expensive and overheated. Yeah. And they are going to be lasting for whom? That's the key question, isn't it? Uh, Mr. Xu, uh, printing dollar campaign in the United States is no secret. This time, very efficient. What do you make of the inflation issue, uh, the dollar issue, and the future as the geopolitics is also coming into being? Uh, there is a, a risk of inflation but I wouldn't get a carried away. I don't think it's going to be run away inflation. I think inflation will be somewhat higher than pre-pandemic level, but it's unlikely to have a serious inflation shock. What about the overwhelming uh, amount of dollars being printed since this administration also coming into being? I mean, the Biden administration. Um, well, um, I think um, uh, there's nothing wrong to do that, right? I mean, first of all, it's, it's going to be a gigantic social en uh, engineer. Uh, secondly, I think if you take lesson from the previous crisis, you would rather overdo that initially. So the question is whether uh, the administration has any stomach to withdraw liquidity when recovery um, is underway. So that's unknown. That is one issue, but it's only for the United States. For the rest of the world, it's about when the U.S. is going to do that. Are they going to do that only depending on their own timetable, whether other economies are going to be hurt as a result of the U.S. only looking at its own timetable of economic recovery, while at the same time the U.S. dollar is, printing, is playing a dominating role? All of this money spending is not going to be good in the long run. It is a good time to be an old American. It is not a good time to be a young American because all my, my kids are going to be left with huge, huge amounts of debt. And that's going to have serious consequences in the future. Yeah. And in the meantime, there will be inflation. There always has been throughout history. When you print huge amounts of money, it leads to a sustained inflation. 
All right. We understand even Russia, since you interacted with uh, the Economic Forum now on the ground, uh, uh, Mr. Rogers, Russia has already warned that it's likely to ditch dollar-denominated oil contracts if the U.S. put on more sanctions against Russia. Now, of course, these are politics, these are postures, but on the other hand, what does it say about the dollar and the issue of dollar being so much in the politics? Well, Ken, Wei, more and more countries are looking for something to compete with the dollar because the U.S. put sanctions on you if they get angry at you. That's not the way an international medium of exchange is supposed to work. It's supposed to be neutral. And so countries, China, Russia, India, Brazil, other countries are looking now for something to compete with the U.S. dollar for political reasons, and they should. And for economic reasons, they should too. The U.S. is the largest debtor nation in world history. This is getting serious for the dollar. Mm. Now, Dr. Xu, you are based in China, even though you are working for a multinational company. We understand China and the United States uh, have been talking to one another on the issue of finance as well with Yellen and also the Chinese vice premier. How should we understand from this part of the world the dollar issue with the uh, St. Petersburg Economic Forum focusing so much its attention on this issue as well? If you have the large, the most important reserve currency, you have to be careful not to use, not to weaponize it. Uh, that is why other countries do look for mm -hmm. alternatives. But having said that, uh, I think in the near term, um, dollar's position is unlikely to be challenged. Mm -hmm. But of course, China would make a um, steady and gradual effort to liberalize its financial system. And ultimately, in the long run, RMB will be a reserve currency, uh, but it's going to happen very gradually. Dr. Zhao, you are a geopolitical expert. Let me go to you about that. Uh, geopolitics, China-U.S. relations are getting ever worse. No secret about that. Meanwhile, Washington is not moving on a positive term with Russia, even though in the middle of June, there's likely to be a meeting at the highest level uh, in Geneva between the Russian and the U.S. leaders. So how do you read all of these signals out of very complex and uncertain pictures? Oh, I, I found this uh, quite difficult to agree that kind of a view that Sino-Russian cooperation and deepening the cooperation poses some challenges to the United States. And in fact, uh, the all three uh, sets of uh, bilateral relations, they have their own independent uh, logic of development. So uh, both uh, China and Russia have very close uh, political, economic, and social ties with the United States. So I think uh, instead of uh, you know some kind of a demonizing the Sino-Russian cooperation and impose some dual containment strategy against it, I would suggest to concentrate on some internal forces and the independent value of these three sets of bilateral relations separately and to find our approaches to manage our differences and to expand the consensus. I find that fascinating. Tell me more about that. I think uh, it's, more, it's very important uh, to know that China and Russia, we have already discovered uh, some kind of uh, golden principles of interaction, such as non-alliance, non-confrontation, and non-targeting, especially on any third party. I think they, it surpasses the institutional constraints of necessity to uh, establish any type of uh, imaginary enemies as the consensus building measure. So I think, uh, cooperation between China and Russia are very natural and uh, mutual beneficial. So we are not targeting on any uh, third parties. In the other way, we are providing some public goods uh, to establish kind of a new type of uh, interactions between major powers. This is uh, more valuable for other uh, countries to observe, I think. How would you say the, you know, the success of a Biden administration's uh, policy approach uh, and that of Washington right now uh, toward China and Russia. Some suggest, uh, and jokingly talking about it, that if China and Russia are getting ever closer together, then that means a huge failure of this 
Biden administration policies toward the two countries and its approach uh, approaching geopolitics. Do you see that is the way to look at it? Well, of course I do. It's happening, as I say. If the trade is, is expanding between the two. Lots of things are expanding between the two. Mr. Trump made enemies many places, including China and including Russia. At least someone in Washington knows that now and is trying to open the doors again. I hope they keep the doors open and I hope everybody goes through the doors and we go back to having where everybody is trading and friendly with each other. I don't know if Mr. Biden and his people are smart enough to do that. Interesting. Final question before we go. We are still in the middle of a global pandemic. The variants are going to be a huge headache for all of us. Even though the global vaccination campaign is ongoing, there is still access problems, equity problems, and many related to it. So in the middle of all of this, China and Russia, the United States, are key providers of the current vaccinations that are listed on the WHO's shortlist for emergency use. How do you see these three countries are likely to play their role, you know, even maybe a few years now in retrospect in that regard? Uh, Mr. Rogers, as an investor, how do you see that? Well, if the vaccines work and if the, the epidemic passes, it will be like every other epidemic, the aftermath, you know, the, the economy is expand for a while and everybody is very happy and pleased. It looks like the, the, the vaccinations work. I've had mine. If they work, things will be OK in a couple at least things will be back to normal in a couple of years. That does not mean there won't be economic problems again. Mm. We've always had economic problems and we will have them again. All right. Uh Dr. Xu. Um, well, uh, from China's perspective, I think China has made a, a very uh, uh, important adjustment just of late. And clearly to roll out a vaccine is a top priority. So my prediction is sometime in summer, China will achieve herd immunity. Well, in urban China, for sure. So that will lay the foundation for creating some travel bubbles between China and countries who are being effective in containing errors. So that's the mm -hmm. second step. Then the third step, I think China had, will export vaccine and then we go back to the normal days as what Jim has alluded. Mm. Dr. Zhao. Well, I think there is a, a step that we can, we can move forward and discuss the, the joint actions of ratification of those three type of or, or the, uh, vaccines provided by three countries for the international travelers. For example, when you have vaccinated uh, by the, uh, the vaccines provided by the United States or Russian, so China would have some uh, uh, green channels for those uh, travelers to, to come into China. Because uh, in the uh, end, the, the question still remains like how we can reopen our countries. Sure. It's not a question just for China, but also for Russia and the United States. So I think that kind of uh, question with uh, public goods meanings could be the priority for three of us for the deeper discussion. Mm. Zhao Long, Jim Rogers, Xu Tao, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us.